All right, so we are in the last few weeks of the book of Ephesians. If you've been with us the whole time, we'll be here probably a few more weeks. Not probably, I just can't remember if it's two or three. Three kids, six and under, man. Can't remember. Um, So what we said in the previous weeks was that the first half of the book, chapters one, two, three, deal primarily with theology, and the last half, which we're in now, deal primarily with behavior and application. Now that's an oversimplification. It's not to say that one, two, and three are pure theology, and the last half is pure behavior and application, but for the most part, that holds true. And we've been going off this theme that we've established since week one surrounding one particular special word, and it's that great big Greek word up there, and you don't have to to necessarily know what it is in Greek, but the point is this, is that one big word translates to the word unite. And Paul is making the claim in the first century in the Roman Empire that in and through Jesus Christ, the crucified one, God is uniting all things in heaven and on earth. And we've talked about in previous week the significance of what that word means. You can go back and listen to those online. And we've talked about in previous weeks how that's it, that's a crazy claim of the crucified one, the Jewish crucified Messiah, the man who died the slave's death on a cross, is indeed not only Lord and Lords and King of Kings, but all things are being united underneath his Lordship. And throughout Ephesians, the book has traced different things, domains or spheres that have been at odds with each other, but because of Christ, they are becoming one. So heaven and earth are becoming one. Jew and Gentile are becoming one. Male and female are becoming one, and they're becoming one under the banner and Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul made the turn in chapter three and four to say Christ is king and he's the head of the church and the head of the church is in heaven, but his body, the church, is here on earth with the implication of this, that it's in and through his body, the church, you and me, followers of Jesus, that Jesus, the head, is exercising his sovereignty on earth which means the will of God is being executed and implemented by people like you and me who are on earth submitted to King Jesus who is in heaven. And Paul's been mapping out what we ought to do with our lives, how we ought to behave in light of said theological truth. And that's where we pick up today. And Paul says, chapter five, Ephesians, therefore, Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now this first statement can easily be glossed over. Be imitators of God. And you can just say to yourself, oh, it means, you know, be like God. But this is a massive, this is, this statement is profound. See, we assume that God is good and we should try and behave like God. But in the world that Paul lived in, in the Greco-Roman world, this is not a normal assumption. See, we're working off two presuppositions. One, that someone ought to try and behave like God, even if that were possible. And then two, that the gods or goddesses that do exist behave in a manner worthy of imitation. And what I mean by that is, even if there is gods or goddesses out there, why should we behave like them? Because in the first century world, the world of Paul in the book of Ephesians, the god and goddesses behaved badly. They were often worse than humans. So to make the claim that you should imitate them is already like, why would you want to do that? So you might remember from high school learning about the the gods and goddesses of the the Greco-Roman world, but it's like most things in high school, you know, you learn enough, but they don't teach you the stuff that would like make mom and dad come and complain to the school district because it was like, well, you've come to South Valley Community Church and you're going to learn a little bit about that. So uh, you recognize this person? Medusa. And in kind of common cultural knowledge, Medusa is this evil t- sort of woman who has snakes for hair and if, if she looks at you, you get turned to stone. And often she's depicted as a bad guy who the hero has to come and defeat. But there's a backstory to Medusa. And it's one that, again, demonstrates the behavior of the gods. See, Medusa was a beautiful woman 
and she was committed to serving the goddess Athena. And she wanted to serve the goddess unhindered and undistracted. So she dedicated herself to be a virgin and spend her entire life serving Athena and Athena alone. Men from all across the world pursued her and tried to get her to marry them, but she just denied it, saying, no, I am focused on the goddess. Poseidon, the god of the sea, took notice of her, and he pursued her. But Medusa denied his advances, but Poseidon kept pushing, pushing to the point of force. Medusa would run into the temple of Athena, hoping she'd find protection there, but rather than find protection, she was left alone, and Poseidon raped her. Now, upon hearing of this, Athena, rather than be mad at Poseidon, curses Medusa for allowing her temple to be defiled. So the woman, instead of the man, is punished. And her punishment is this. Athena turns her into this kind of hideous monster with serpent hair, and she says, for the rest of your life, if anyone looks upon you, they'll be turned to stone. That's the behavior of the gods. Now, speaking of Athena, she uh, was once challenged to a weaving contest. Weave some baskets, you know? You want to battle? I'm a good weaver. And she was challenged by Arachne, another goddess, And Arachne was actually the better weaver, but Athena in her pride still took her up for the challenge. And long story short, Arachne did indeed weave better. And when Athena realized she was going to lose, she beat and shamed Arachne. Arachne, in torment and shame, hung herself. But before she could die and kill herself, Athena turned her into a spider. You saw this foreshadowed with Arachne. This is the behavior of the gods. Here's another, this is Hades, god of the underworld. Now it's interesting because he's the god of the underworld, but if you grade on the curve, he might actually be one of the better behaved one, better behaved gods or goddesses. Hades was promised Persophanes in marriage, but Persophanes didn't want to marry Hades. She rejected the marriage, but then one day when Persophanes was alone in a field picking flowers, Hades abducts her. He basically kidnaps her, takes her to the underworld, and forces marriage. So again, these guys, I mean, it's just like this horrible story after horrible story. Who would want to behave like these people? Now, you may be telling yourself, okay, what about the king of the gods, Zeus? Because maybe it's one of those situations where all the kids are messed up, but you know, dad's still pretty chill. Even though the kids are whack, it's like, no. You don't get any better. Zeus is called the all-father. He is the father of all in the thought of the day. But Zeus was no better than his children. Zeus married a woman and then divorced her because he wanted to marry Hera. But then upon being married to Hera, he continued in adultery. He continued with incestuous practices. He was a serial rapist and murderer. And this is brought to the extreme when one man dared challenge Zeus for the good of humanity. A guy named Prometheus stole fire from heaven in order to give it to the humans because he knew it would be good for humanity. Zeus, upon hearing of Prometheus stealing of the fire, captured him and sentenced him and cursed him. The sentence was this. He was to be chained to a rock. And upon being chained to a rock, an eagle would come, which an eagle is Zeus's symbol, it's his image. The eagle would come and eat out his stomach and eat his liver. So it's pain and agony while being tied to a rock. What made it worse, though, is Zeus said that the liver would grow back every single day and the eagle would return every single day and go on for eternity. It is in this world, in this world, precisely this world, that the Apostle Paul says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Do you see the the profound nature of this statement? And there's other implications. You are beloved children, which means fundamentally that God is a father. And so the Christian claim, what Paul is going around claiming in the Roman Empire, is that God is not like Zeus or Athena or Apollo or Poseidon, but God is like his son Jesus. And God by nature fundamentally is a good father and you are his beloved 
children. Therefore, walk like him. Imitate him. We take it for granted that God is good. We think if God exists, he ought to be good. He ought to love me. He ought to love people. That is a presupposition built upon 2,000 years of Judeo-Christian values. God doesn't have to be good. But the God of the Bible and the God of Israel and the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is good. So Paul says, imitate him. Now in one sense, Paul doesn't have to say, imitate God. Because Paul knows that whoever you think is God, whoever you worship, you by default are going to imitate Paul's greater concern is is that you're worshiping and imitating the right God. In in the modern world, we have people who don't believe in God. In Paul's day, everyone believed in God. The question was, which one? And so Paul wants to encourage them to worship and imitate the right God. But Paul also knows that by default, you will imitate whoever you think God is. And this is a deep concept. Let me explain. This triangle represents what we'll call the hierarchy of values. And we all use a hierarchy of values. Without a hierarchy of values, you couldn't even walk across the street. The hierarchy orders your perceptions. Let me say what I mean by that. If you were to just like ride your bike, there are so many things that you could be paying attention to. There's so much information that your five senses are processing. But what your mind automatically focuses on is what's important for the task. So you're stopped at a four-way intersection. What's most important? Are there cars coming? Because you don't want to get ran over. You are not focused on the tree in the background because the tree's not what's important right there. The hierarchy of values orders your perceptions. Or let's say you're driving on the freeway. Do you know how much information your mind is processing as you're driving 83 miles per hour (laughs) down the road? Car, 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 car different color license plate, tree, road. There's tons of information, but your mind, based upon the hierarchy of values, what is most important for the situation, orders your perception so that you automatically focus on what's necessary. It's like you're not, you're not remembering every last car that you passed. It'd be too much. Car, 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 this way, this way, bad driver, good driver, too slow driver. Oh, the tags are expired. <laughs> oh man, my tags are expired. <laughs> oh man. Why do I have to get tags? When I get a check, the government has already taxed me. And then they're gonna make me get registration to drive on roads that my taxes paid for. And then if I were to stop and get a snack, they would tax me on the candy bar. That's, this is a whole nother sermon uh, for another time. <laughs> but you get, you get the point, your brain goes to what's, value, what's valuable in the moment. So some more complex examples. Let's say you're a 15 year old boy in high school and you're in math class. Okay. And you're, you know, you want to get good grades. So you value good grades. So you're paying attention, but it's sort of midway through lecture and you kind of already know what's being said. So only 70, maybe 80% of your mental faculties are focused on what the teacher is saying. The other 20%, you're thinking about Fortnite. You're kind of hungry, what snacks you're going to get. But you're, paid, you're paying relative attention. But then the teacher says, all right, listen up. This is going to be on the test. Right? The value system kicks in, and now your perceptions are going to be ordered so that you're not paying attention to, you know, the poster on the wall or Bubba over here or Johnny over here. You're focused because the teacher's going to tell you what's on the test. The value system kicks in. Now, <clears throat> let's say in that same situation we insert something else. And what we're gonna insert is the girl that the 15 year old boy likes, that he has a crush on. Now, what are you focused on in that moment? The girl. Teacher's talking, it don't matter, because yeah, I wanna get good grades, but I love this girl. Yes, she doesn't know my name, but I love her. We've never talked, but I love her, I will marry her. And then, you know what happens? She turns around and everything else in the room disappears, right? Because the girl you have a crush on, hey, I forgot my pencil. Can I borrow a pencil? 
Yes, yes, you can borrow a pencil. Here you go. Nothing else matters in that situation because the girl's more valuable than the grade at that point. Now, here's another one. Let's say, uh, if you have kids, pretend you don't have kids. And if you don't have kids, this will be way easier exercise for the first part. The second part will be a lot harder. Now, pretend you don't have kids and you are going, you're camping, all right? You got a beautiful fire going, a fire pit, and it's just you, if you're single, you stay single. If, if you're married, uh, picture your spouse there and you're around. It's like, man, you're noticing how beautiful the trees are. You look up at the sky, you go, man, there's a lot of stars, you know? Because when you're in the city, you only see Venus, the brightest star of them all. And it's like so many disappear, but now you're noticing all the beautiful stars and the trees, and you're listening to all the sounds of nature, and you're just like, man, this is great. Okay, same situation, but let's say you got three kids under the age of six. Okay. And there's a fire pit. What, what are you doing? Your, your, your perceptions have been ordered. You're only paying attention to certain things. Why? Because you are responsible for three little creatures that are attracted to the light. They're tra- like little bugs. They are attracted to the light. So you're not, oh, look at the beautiful stars and look at the, be- listen to the crickets. No, nah, it don't matter about the crickets. Hierarchy of values, okay? And, and that orders your perceptions. Now, that which sits on top of the triangle is by definition your God. That which sits on top of the triangle is by definition your God. Even if you're not a religious person, even if you say you don't believe in God, that which sits on top of the triangle, on top of the hierarchy, is God by definition. And whatever's at the top of the triangle, you will live for, you will die for, you will work for, you will breathe for, and you will change your behavior in order to please or obtain. It's just the way it works. And you can see this play out in a more playful way. Say with children, they might watch uh, a Star Wars movie for the first time. And let's say the five just watch Star Wars for the first time. And right after, what do they do? They find something that sort of looks like a lightsaber. And they pick it up. And, and I'm battling. I'm going to, you know? Because for like 30 to 90 minutes after, their world is consumed by the characters in that story. And they, by default, will start to imitate the characters. They will want to be, Luke, Sky- Luke Skywalker is the best, and so you want to be like him. Uh, and maybe a more sinister example would be if you have a young adolescent, and they made a new friend, and the new friend isn't, isn't the best kid. Got a rough around the edge. It does, has some bad behavior. But your child thinks they are the coolest kid on God's good green earth. So what happens? They, by default, automatically start absorbing some of the behavior. They will imitate it. Whatever sits on top of your hierarchy, whatever sits at the top of the triangle, is by definition your God, and by default, you will imitate it. You watch who young people look up to, look at their behavior. You look at what American adults look up to, look at their behavior. It will always imitate it. You will be conformed to the image of your God, whatever or whoever it may be. And so Paul is concerned that you not only believe in a God, everyone believed in a God, but that you put the right God at the top of the triangle. Or another way to say it, you put the right king on the throne. And so he's able to say, imitate God, as beloved children, God is fundamentally a good father, and you fundamentally as a Christian are his child. Put him at the top, and your behavior will be modeled after him. Now, remember what I said about the other gods, how they behaved. Paul is going to list now things we ought not to do, and I want to show you the first things that come up on the list. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, 
I have a hard time saying that, too many S's and sounds, must not even be named among you, as it is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and Christ. Now you want to have an offensive message for our culture? Say, anyone who is sexually immoral or pure has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. That's not, that's not what, what you say in, in, in our culture. But yet Paul and the first Christians were insistent, do not practice sexual immorality. The gods and goddesses of of the Greco-Roman world do that. But not the God of Israel, not the God and Father of Jesus. You don't live that way. Now the first Christians took this serious. So serious that when we read the ancient literature from both pagan and Christian sources, early Christians were described as displaying three distinctives from the rest of culture. Now they had lots of distinctions from the rest of culture, but there's three things that come up again and again in the literature. First, the early church was known to believe and worship only one God. It's a big deal in the ancient world. Not to us, but it's a big deal. They were known for that. The pagan writers, the Christian writers, they all say, we only worship one God. And the pagans would say, yeah, these Christians are crazy. They only worship one God. Second, they were known for caring for the poor, the vulnerable, and the oppressed. Again and again and again, it comes up in the literature. The Christians care about the needy. Now, you might not be surprised by that. Well, no, all kinds of people care about the needy. Lots of people have have hearts for the poor. Look, in the ancient world, people didn't think it was a good thing to care about the poor. Christianity taught you that the poor were worthy recipients of compassion because you were a recipient of compassion from God. In many cultures to this day, and certainly most in the ancient world, caring for the hurting was not seen as a good thing. It's Christianity that taught the world that. Third, and relevant for us today, is Christians were known for their strict sexual ethic. Christians were known to believe in something called lifelong monogamy. This is also inherited from the Jewish faith as well. But in the pagan world, this wasn't like the standard. You, promiscuity was, was accepted and encouraged. Promiscuity was all around. The only people who couldn't do that were typically the poor who were given a role, and then if you, especially if you were a poor woman. But if you were a wealthy man, promiscuity, having sex with as many people as possible was not only accepted, it was encouraged. Why not? Receive sexual fulfillment, it's a good thing. But it was in that world that the Christian says, no, 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 we do it different. We commit to one wife, and it's lifelong. So you have Tertullian writing roughly 100 years after the composition of the New Testament. He says, one in mind and soul, we do not hesitate to share our earthly goods with one another. All things in common among us, but our wives. Which is sort of like, why do you need to to say we share everything but our wives. You know, in our culture, you wouldn't say, hey, you know, South Valley Community Church, we welcome you this morning. If you're a visitor for the first time, you know, we got some cookies for you. Uh, We're a great community and we don't share wives. (laughs) You know, it's just not something we do. Your immediate reaction would be, these guys are either nuts or do the other churches share wives? Like, this is bizarre. Why would you say this? Why would you say this? And it's because it's a common practice of promiscuity in the ancient world. And so Tertullian says, hey, look, we share all things, but not our spouses. We don't do that behavior. Another second century document, Christians share their meals, but not their sexual partners. And again, it was, it was just sort of assumed. It's like, oh, these Christians, they get up early on Sunday morning and they have a meal together and they're all gathered there. Well, what else are they doing? We know what we would do. Why else would you get up that early in the morning? Not just for a sandwich. Like it's, it's gotta be some, it was just, ex- promiscuity was accepted. We don't share sexual partners. 
Last example, another second century document. But we maintain our modesty, not in appearance, but in our heart, and we gladly abide by the bond of single marriage in desire of procreating. We know either one wife or none at all. The first Christians were committed to singleness or lifelong monogamy. And so if you are single, sometimes they call it marriage unto the Lord. It was like you were, you were bypassing earthly marriage and going straight to the heavenly marriage of Christ and his church. And then married people were intended to be married for life. Tim Keller, a pastor from New York, summarizes the early Christian ethic in a way that beautifully illustrates the point. He says, the early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and they gave practically everybody their money. And that's what the first Christians were known for. Sharing and generosity and care and compassion, but a strict sexual ethic. Now, when you hear the word strict, you think negative. Strict sexual ethic, oh, it was a bad one. The first Christians were insistent that it wasn't strict in a bad way, but that if you submit to God's law for human sexuality, that sexuality would flourish. Sexual fulfillment as God designed would be obtained. So it wasn't like a, a repressive backwards way, a strict sexual ethic. It was boundaries so that sexual life could flourish. And that's why Paul says, but sexual immorality and all impurity, it's not even gonna be named among you. You don't, even, you don't even get into that. There's a thought of the day, and tell me if it sounds familiar. In Paul's day, it was like, hey, if you have the resources and you, know, you just want to have a good time, it's just your body. Have sex with whoever you want. It doesn't harm anybody. No one gets hurt. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't hurt. If no one's getting hurt, just have sex however you want. It's all good. We're the enlightened ones. We realize that there's some people who have these strict sexual standards, but, you know, they're going to live the boring lives and we're going to live the enlightened ones. Flash forward. What do, you, what do you hear? Oh, the Christians. They have these old school, repressive, oppressive sexual ethics, but humanity, we've progressed. We now know better. You know, your body... Have sex, that's not gonna, it doesn't have no implications for your soul or your spirit. It's just, it's just a one night stand. It doesn't have any impact outside of that. If it makes you feel good, go ahead and do it. And see, the first Christians would say, no, 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 you don't understand. You can't just do stuff with your body and have it divorced from every, every, everything else. And in fact, Promiscuous sex is a parody, a parody of real sex. Real sex takes place in lifelong monogamy. And when, you, when you're outside of that, you're participating in a parody. It's like going to a puddle of mud to drink water when there's a fresh stream going by you. Or to put it in terms of intimacy, it's like being upstairs and FaceTiming a family member who's downstairs rather than talking to him face to face. It's a divorce of intimacy. Or a third way, it's like going to Chipotle for a burrito when you have Griense and Ameca in town. <laughs> it's like, why would you ever do that? It's the fake, it's the parody, it's not the real thing. So the lie is be free, do what you want, do what pleases the body, it's all good. And Paul is gonna say, let no one deceive you with these empty words. For because these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Heavy language. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Verse 8, even heavier language. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul's day was much like ours. He, he knows what people think. You know, the, the Christians, they have these strict ethical standards and who wants to live like that? And Paul's saying, don't believe that for a bit. This sexual life outside of God's standard, it will wreck you. 
It will harm you. It'll harm you. Nothing good will come out of it. And you see this, by the way, um, playing out in our culture before us. Look at, look at where sexual ethics is leading our culture. We're all more miserable in our relationships than ever before. One of the most sad places when it comes to intimacy and sexual fulfillment in our country right now is on college campuses. It's where you bought into the ethics of the day rather than the scriptures where you find some of the most depressed people, the most lonely people, the people who even if they could enter into an intimate relationship, they wouldn't even know how to be intimate. And they're more sexually unfulfilled than ever. And they've bought into that. This is why Paul's saying, don't believe it. You live that lifestyle, it'll eat you up and it'll tear your life apart. And some of you, and I want to be sensitive to this because we all come from different paths, we know the fruit of that, right? Some of us have experienced adultery. Some of us have committed that. Some of us have seen betrayal in our lives. Some of you know what it's like to to raise kids by yourself without another parent there. You lose sight of those ethics and everyone suffers. And that's what we're seeing and perpetuating right now in our our culture. And because of that, Paul has these strong words. He says, look, when you do this stuff, the wrath of God is going to come upon you. Who wants to hear that, right? You don't want to come to church today and hear about the wrath of God coming down on you. Now we've talked about this in the past, but there's, there's two sides to the wrath of God. It's important for us today. There's the active wrath of God and the passive wrath of God. The active wrath of God is where God supernaturally intervenes in a moment and does something. So for example, uh, we had a wonderful heartwarming Christmas series here at South Valley Community Church where we talked about the sin of Onan. And you remember the sin of Onan? And Onan, Onan commits this great sin and what does God do? He kills him. It's like, bro, you're not allowed to do that, boom. That's active wrath of God. You do this and judgment comes, active wrath. Then there's also the passive wrath of God. Passive wrath is when the consequence to a behavior is embedded in the behavior. When the consequence or punishment is embedded in the behavior itself. So here's an example. Uh, You start smoking religiously at the age of 12 and you smoke your entire life, and then you get lung cancer, and then someone asks you, what, 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 why do you think you got lung cancer? You would say, hey man, I chained smoke since I was a kid, and I was more susceptible to this. The, the consequence is embedded and built into the behavior itself. When the Bible talks about sexual sin, sexual morality, it will often use the category not of active wrath, but passive wrath. Meaning that when you are doing sex outside of God's standards, the punishment to said behavior is embedded in the behavior itself. And again, we see that playing out. We don't know how to be intimate. We're not finding sexual fulfillment. Marriages are falling apart. Kids are growing up without father figures. And it's all before us. It's, it's, it's happening before our very eyes. And then the worst thing, and Paul talks about this in Romans chapter one. He says, of these people who are participating in this type of sexual morality, that God actually hands them over to their desires, that's passive wrath. So it's like you're doing a behavior that's sinful, and what's the punishment? In Romans one, Paul says, God just gives you over to your own desire. This is always best illustrated, unfortunately, with addiction. So you want this substance, you want it, what happens? You become a slave to it, and you desire it all the more. And God's passive wrath is that you're actually given what you want, you're handed over to your own desires. And you become a slave to sin in that way. And this, of course, plays out with with sexual promiscuity. It's like, you find a little bit of sexual fulfillment by sleeping around, but that fulfillment doesn't last because it's not a becoming of one flesh and soul type of intimacy. And so it feels good for a moment and it lasts and so you wanna have more sex. And then you, then you do and you, you go down that cycle and pretty soon you're having more and more sex but it's less and less fulfilling. Uh, 
Uh, ben Affleck, hard right turn, uh, gave an interview recently. It's been like a year and a half, two years after he divorced Jennifer Gardner. And in this interview, he was pretty brutally honest. And in it, he said that the biggest regret of his life is getting a divorce to Jennifer Gardner. It's the biggest regret. He says he regrets it all the time, like every day. It's his biggest mistake. And when he was married, he picked up some bad habits. And he described what the bad habits did to him and ultimately to their marriage. But one succinct quote illustrates it quite well. Ben Affleck says, you're trying to make yourself feel better with eating or drinking or sex or gambling or shopping or whatever, but that ends up making your life worse. Then you do more of it, the same behavior, to make that discomfort go away. Then the real pain begins. It becomes a vicious cycle you can't break. That's haunting. I mean, you, you get this. You're doing something to cope, to find fulfillment, but you're not getting it from that. And then there's sadness and discomfort and depression. But then what do you run to when you have sadness, discomfort, and depression? You go back to the only things that give you a little bit of boost, your comfort, your coping mechanism. And then it's a sick cycle where you become more and more enslaved and you find less and less fulfillment of it. And then the haunting words is when he says, then the real pain starts. It's almost like, that's so deep, it's almost like comic book, like Batman level deep. You know, but, you know I'm, he played Batman, but I'm not. It's like, think, think not Ben Affleck Batman. Think Christian Bale Batman. You know, Bane breaks Christian Bale's back and then he's talking to him and he's like, I'm gonna do this, this, and this, but I'm not gonna kill you. I'm gonna, help, I'm gonna make you watch people suffer, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, and then Bane says to Batman like, and this is where the, the, the pain really begins. It's like, oh, you thought all of that was horrible. You thought having your back broken was bad. This is where the pain begins. And in a very parallel way, it's creepy. Ben Affleck goes, when you've gone through those cycles of sin and you think it can't hurt or any worse, when you go back to your coping mechanism and you realize they won't give you fulfillment and comfort, that's when the real pain begins. And it becomes a vicious cycle you can't break. And that's what's unfolding in our culture before our eyes. So Paul says with a warning, let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Don't live like them. For you were once like them. You were in the darkness. You were darkness, but now Christ has changed you. You are light and walk as children of light for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. This phrase, the fruit of light. I want to stop on there for a moment. Um, when you, this is the logic. When you imitate God and you imitate the right God, your life will be changed and your behavior will change. And that behavior will produce fruit. In other words, something good for the world to eat. It's a fruit to offer to the world. Um, I, I co-host a podcast, and, and we have lots of guests on it, and one of the guests we had was a guy named Oz Guinness, kind of a philosopher, social critic, He's wrote a lot of books, some of you may know who he is. But Oz Guinness said that right now, we are living in the, like, the greatest time for the gospel to spread. And I'm going like, yeah, like in the other countries, right, where the gospel is exploding and stuff? He goes, No. Like in America, we live in the greatest, op- op- that's the greatest opportunity for the gospel to advance right now. And I'm like, okay, bro, you don't live in California, man. You don't know the Bay Area. You don't know Silicon Valley. You don't know tech. Yeah, maybe like in S- North Dakota. He goes, no, no, I actually mean America, but in particularly like the Bay Area and California and New York and these places you wouldn't think. And this is what he said. He said the church is at a critical moment where they could demonstrate the fruit of what Christian ethics produce and then hold that over and against the fruit that the secular ethics of the day are producing. So in other words, you say, Christian ethics say this, husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. We're gonna talk about this next week. What does that look like? And what does it look like for 
moms and dads to care more about the nurturing of their children than they do the advancement of their career? And what does it look like when there, there's not single mothers having a struggle to get by? When Christians do family right, there's a fruit that's produced out of that. And he says, you show those Christian ethics to the, to the rest of the world and then say, look at, look at where secular ethics leads. And this was a harder case to make 10 years ago. It's a lot easier to make now. But where, where has secular ethics divorced from Christianity led in our, in our country right now? We're just on the tip of it, by the way. But it's led to polygamy, polyamory, pornography, and promiscuity. And so Os Guinness says, you show them the fruit of that. And you, you look at what's going on, like with sexual ethics in our country. What you thought was unthinkable 10 years ago is going mainstream. I mean, we have sex, sexual and secular ethics right now saying, hey, I think it's a wise thing to give hormone blockers to a three or four year old. That's insanity. And wherever you land on the spectrum of all the controversial debates, you show the world, no matter where you're at on, that, on those issues, that's insanity. And so you say, look, compare the fruit. Compare the fruit. This is what this produces and this is what this produces. And that's difficult because I know many of us have tried to do that and it falls apart. The marriage falls apart and now you're struggling through the difficulty of it falling apart. And my encouragement to you is stay faithful in your family. Do your best to make it work. Some of you have kids half time this day or that day and it's hard because there's all, you do your best. You hold it down and you do your best. But all of this is rooted in the fact that as a whole, our culture has divorced ourselves from the scripture and now sexual ethics are running rampant. And what do we look like? We look a lot like the gods of the Greco-Roman world. We look a lot more like Athena than Jesus. Look a lot more like Apollo or Poseidon. And lastly, Paul says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. This, there's this phrase, verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of things that they do in secret. Two types of people here today, probably. It's like, it's shameful even to speak about what they do. There's some of you who are going, man, I don't know what they were doing, but I don't want to know. And then there's some of you, if you're honest, like, well, what were they, what were they doing, man? That, why would it be so shameful that you can't even speak of it? And so you begin to wonder. That's like my mind. I immediately want to go, I search all the history books, and da, 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 what, what were they doing that Paul says it's too shameful to even speak of? And your mind starts to think, and then you just got to stop, and you go, I don't need to know that. I don't need to find that answer in a history because I already know what they were doing in secret. It's the same thing we do in secret. It's the same stuff we're doing in secret. Stuff that I could not without shame even repeat from this stage. For example, probably everyone in this room knows that Americans on the whole are struggling with pornography. More men than women, but both men and women, but certainly in the percentages, men's higher. Okay, so we know that. That's bad enough, all right? You're bombarded with a digital world that has never existed in human history. And you're attacked left and right. And you're in bondage to that sin. And like you become a slave to it. That's bad enough. But what probably most of you don't know is the type of pornography that's the trending type of pornography. So if you're 50 in this room, when you snuck out to, to uncle's garage and saw a playboy, that was bad enough. That was pornography that you shouldn't have seen. But what people are viewing online now, what your kids are viewing online now, what your teenagers may be looking at online right now, is so far beyond what you saw in the Playboy, I can't even speak it without feeling shame. Because the type of pornography that people are viewing is absolutely out of question, unacceptable to talk about on this stage. Or what about the Super Bowl? America's great big event, right? 
What's the Super Bowl about? Football, okay. But what also happens at the Super Bowl? People from around the world come to participate in a specific gathering of the highest condensation of sex trafficking in the world. I mean, it all comes for the big event from all around the world. Women, men, girls, boys. And you hear about the statistics about how many of them are underaged, forced into prostitution. And you go, I don't know, how, how could that even exist? How, how, I mean, surely there's only a few like, people out there who are going to look for underage prostitution. Surely it's only a few people. It's like, pff, it's big business, man. It's real big business. And when they rescue those girls and boys from those situations, they'll tell you, people from all walks of life show up. Customer after customer after customer. That's on American soil. Things that are unspeakable. What is done in secret, you can't even talk about. And you may say, well, that's good because, you know, I've never sought out a prostitute. I've never gone to a strip club. Uh, I certainly would never solicit an underage person for prostitution. It's like, no, but don't you know that when you view pornography, you are participating in the same web, the same system, and it's all connected. It's all connected. And all of us have been affected by it. Everyone in this room. When God's sexual ethics go out the window, it damages the whole culture. Even if you want to be innocent, you're affected by it. And so Christians ought to do our best not to participate in that, but rather expose it. Expose the darkness with the light. And that comes from something as simple as, trust me on this, stopping to watch certain TV shows that you should not be watching as a Christian. Because it's all connected. And all those images are rewiring your brain always. And so there's no way to eject from the world where you're not gonna have some of it. It's always gonna be, it's gonna be popping up. But you gotta work hard to disengage from as much as you can. And it's a, it's, it's a lifelong battle. It's a lifelong battle. And we're gonna be doing a series down the road for parents that are gonna talk about kids, um, how to raise kids in this, in, 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 in this culture because um, your eight-year-old is gonna have a hard time not seeing stuff. Because even if you do great, you let his friend come over one day and he shows him something that his friend showed him on a phone or something. So Christians have to be aware, we have to be vigilant, we have to do our best to expose this rather than participate in it. Paul ends by saying, therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This was most likely uh, recited to people before they were baptized. It's like a poem, a hymn. So you go to get baptized, and it's, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. You leave behind the old behavior, and you imitate God. Now, the ushers can pass out communion. It would be foolish for me to talk about sexual ethics and knowing everyone in this room, we have habits and lust and sin in our life and just go, you've heard a sermon about not being sexually immoral, so everyone, stop it. and Don't do any of that stuff anymore. And I can't give you like three quick tips on how to never lust again or never participate in the evil system or anything. But I want to leave you with one very important exercise or tool that <clears throat> can be very powerful in, in your life. Um, and it does give you a little bit of help in fighting this battle. Not only with sexual morality, but with everything. And it goes back to that triangle. Okay. Whatever is at the top of your triangle is by definition your God. And by default, whoever or whatever your God is, you will live for, die for, breathe for, and alter your behavior in light of. And so the question for you today is, 
Who or what is at the top of the triangle? Now this is where it's tricky because there could be good things at the top of your triangle, but if they are not God, it's ultimately a bad thing. For example, if you have kids, your kids should be at the top of that triangle, the top portion somewhere, but they can't be at the top. They cannot be your God. And if you do so, you will damage your children. Because if you want to love your spouse better, if you want to love your kids better, you have to have God at the top of the hierarchy. And in doing so, you will be more capable and likely to love your spouse and children better. You make gods out of your children, mark my words, you're going to lose your children. Because you'll be overbearing, you'll be over-controlling, you will obsess with them, you won't give them the space they need, you won't nurture them to be independent human beings that can stand in this world. You'll create a relationship where you have to be fused together and that's not good for them. You make your spouse a God. You have to have God at the top of the hierarchy and then everything else takes its proper place and if you do that rightly, watch. You'll be a better spouse. You'll be a better parent. You'll be a better friend. So what sits atop of the triangle for you today? Because Paul tells you today, to put God on top, the right God, and then imitate him. The God of Christianity is the good heavenly father who loves you as children. So what is it? What's up there? And if you can lower that thing and put the right person at the top of the triangle, or as I said, a better way to say it, put the right person on the throne, you will see how your thoughts change, your behavior changes. Because whatever's on top, you're gonna find yourself living for, breathing for, dying for. Additionally, what makes it very difficult is that we may say, oh, God's on top. But the God that is on top is more like a God of the Greco-Roman world a God who's out to get you, a God who is powerful, and you better not cross him or he's gonna go full Prometheus on you. And so you have these misunderstandings of who God is and it affects your behavior. It affects how you think and live in the world. Paul the Apostle makes the radical claim that Jesus is the one who shows, us what's God, who shows us what God is like. So if you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. You look at Jesus. The problem is when you picture God in your head, you often picture someone like this. And this is why you have to preach the gospel to yourself every single day. Because you're going to think this bad thought about yourself. You're going to hate this person. You're going to think this view about yourself. And all of that is going to continue going on in the same patterns of behavior until you let the gospel truly penetrate your heart. And you have to realize that at the top of all triangles, at the top of all hierarchies, sits someone. And at the top of all triangles, at the top of the highest throne in the highest heaven, someone sits. And that person is not Zeus. That person is the crucified one. The one who loved you enough to die on your behalf. The crucified one. You are his children. Imitate him, for he is a good God. The other gods, not good. He is a good God who loves you and dies for you and cares for you. He knows you. He knows every hair on your head. And so as we enter into communion, may we remove whatever is at the top of the triangle that may not be Jesus. And may we put the right person on the throne. Let's stand as we take communion.